Should we get started or wait? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um. Yeah. So, uh, uh, hello everyone. I'm I'm Jiwon Park from Baruch College. Um, and I will be moderating today's session. Uh, just a quick reminder. Uh, it would be deeply appreciated if you can turn your uh videos on if possible and uh mute yourself. Um unless you have questions. Uh, for questions, you can add, uh, raise your hand using the um, raise hand uh, option, or you could uh, also feel free to um, put your question in the chat box. Um, and then uh, I think uh, we, we should give uh, the presenter today first five minutes to uh, kind of open up what his uh, presentation is gonna uh, be about. Uh, so let's welcome Matt Cedargren from Santa Clara University. He will be um, presenting a very interesting paper about uh, note disclosures. Okay, thanks, Joan, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to present here. Really happy to be here and see everyone. Uh, the paper uh, is a work I have with my co-authors, uh, Changling Chen at University of Waterloo, Kai Chen at Wilfrid Laurier, and Victor Wang at Cal State Long Beach. And we're going to be looking at ASU 201105, which changed the display of the other comprehensive income. And just a little bit of a background on OCI presentation. Uh, prior to this ASU, uh, OCI, its display was largely regulated by FAS 130, which came out in 1997, which allowed three possible placements of OCI. Uh, one was essentially in the income statement. So you'd have a single continuous statement of comprehensive income. You'd have net income. And then immediately below that, you would display the OCI for the period. And then you'd have comprehensive income. The second option was to have a separate statement of comprehensive income immediately following the income statement. And for expositional purposes, we're going to refer to both of these as performance statement presentation because they give the indication that they're to be uh, read and interpreted as some kind of uh, performance measure, emphasizing that they're either on the income statement or a statement of comprehensive income. And then the third option, which as we'll see, proved to be the most popular, was to put OCI in the statement of stockholders equity. So not in the income statement, not in a statement of comprehensive income, but rather in the statement of changes in stockholders' equity, okay, which tends to be the least well-known of the financial statements, certainly as we, um, as we teach accounting. So that was the uh, how OCI and its display was regulated from 1997 up until this ASU that we investigate. And if you look at the... Um, uh, Excuse me. If you look at FAS 130, and if you go to um, the uh, where the uh, each of the board members explain why they voted for it or against it, you'll see that two of the seven FASB members at the time dissented to this statement because they objected uh, to the fact that managers would have that firms would have flexibility. Okay and discretion, basically choosing the prominence of the display of OCI, okay? And then they went into some further criticisms of uh, the fact that the FASB's conceptual framework, at least at the time, didn't define earnings or net income, didn't provide criteria for distinguishing the characteristics of items that should be an OCI rather than uh, net income, and that the qualitative characteristics of the items currently classified as OCI are not conceptually distinguished from those that are included in net income. And uh, a lot of people would argue 26 years later, that's still a pretty accurate description of the state of the world when it comes to OCI. And so some uh, Tom Linsmeyer, who was on the FASB at the time uh, and some co-authors looked at um, what were actually the choices of the firms in displaying OCI. And as I alluded to earlier, most firms, though not all, most firms chose to report OCI in the statement of stockholders' equity, uh, suggesting that maybe they didn't view OCI as useful in evaluation or predicting future performance or whatever. So choosing to put OCI in the statement of stockholders' equity 
uh, proved to be the most popular option uh, when manager when firms were given uh, discretion over essentially choosing how prominently to display uh, their other comprehensive income. So that was kind of the state of things uh, under the previous regime. And then came this ASU 2011-05 presentation of other comprehensive income, which basically took away uh, this discre discretion over the prominence of OCI display. So this ASU uh, basically eliminated the option to display OCI in the statement of stockholders' equity. Okay, so it was effective for fiscal periods beginning after December 15th, 2011. So basically starting in 2012 for calendar year firms. And as I said, basically um, this option here, okay, the statement of changes in stockholders equity, the OCI could no longer be buried in there, so to speak. It would have to be more prominently displayed uh, either in a single continuous statement that included both net income and other comprehensive income to give you a uh, comprehensive income or in a statement of comprehensive income that immediately followed the income statement. So basically the FASB is now mandating a uh, performance statement display <clears throat> for OCI. So what we have here is basically kind of a quasi experimental setting. We have a mandatory change in the placement and the display of OCI. Okay, we have some firms which already reported in a performance statement prior to this ASU coming out and therefore were not impacted by this uh, ASU. Um, and then we have another set of firms that were reporting in OCI in the statement of stockholders equity and were required to change, were required to make the OCI display more prominent. So we have a change in the display of OCI, but without a change uh, in the underlying economics giving rise to OCI. And as I'll discuss in a little bit, our sample period is such that there were no major uh, changes in OCI or its components until ASU 2016-01, which as we learned from Eilina last week, uh, changed the uh, items that go into OCI, the, um, the debt valuation adjustments and the, um, uh, equity, uh, passive uh, equity interests, uh, no more available for sale for equity. Okay, so we have this change in display, but without a change in the components or the underlying economics here. So basically in our setting, the treatment firm is going to be uh, the firms that previously reported their OCI in the statement of stockholders equity, and were therefore required to change that display into a performance statement. And our control firms are going to be those firms that previously reported OCI in a performance statement and therefore were not impacted uh, by this ASU. And as I'll uh, discuss later, um, within our set of sample firms here, we do not have any that actually moved within this uh, category here. So basically, if you were in, you know, like a single continuous statement, you continue to do that afterwards. We don't see any change within that. Uh, after the ASU. So it's basically all people moving from here uh, to one of these two in a performance statement. Okay, so that's kind of the setting uh, of what we're investigating. And this is basically a graphical display of the table in our paper that shows where firms were reporting their OCI uh, before and after the ASU. And as I mentioned before, most firms we're choosing to put it in the statement of changes in stockholders equity. And, but we have a uh, sizable minority of firms that we're putting it in, the, uh, in a performance statement. Okay, and then, and then as you can see, after this ASU became effective, the most popular option was putting it in a separate statement of comprehensive income. Uh, immediately following the income statement. Uh, this little batch here was firms that were uh, not a calendar year firm. So they're 20, th th this X axis here is calendar year. So these are firms that um, were in an off calendar and they still had to, uh, they still had this option this first year here. So what our objectives are, we're trying to do in this study is um, twofold here. One, we want to investigate the impact of this mandated change in the uh, prominence of the display of OCI 
uh, on its value relevance. Now, there were a couple of very early studies that came out very shortly after uh, <laughs> this ASU was enacted, um, and they reported some counterintuitive findings. So there were two studies, this Shabrol and Vikarovich 2015, and this Lin et al. paper in 2018. Both of these papers investigated only one or two years after uh, this, this post-ASU period. And they found that the firms that were changing their, um, their uh, display from the statement of stockholders' equity to a performance statement, they actually had decreased OCI value relevance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the firms that did not switch. Okay? And you know, presumably, this was not the FASB's intention because they wanted to draw more attention and more prominence to OCI. And so they reported these kind of puzzling findings, and the authors of both studies uh, explicitly call for more research on this issue uh, in these papers here, because these were very early studies uh, that use only one or two years of post-ASU data and limit their sample to a relatively small number of firms from which they hand collected the placement of the OCI. So our first uh, objective is to kind of re-examine uh, this impact of ASU uh, 2011-05 and to see if anything has changed since that initial one or two years uh, investigated by these two studies here. <clears throat> Our second is to investigate whether note disclosure characteristics uh, differentially influence value relevance uh, after this ASU makes the display of OCI uh, more prominent, okay? uniformly prominent across all firms. Okay. So basically, when a financial statement item is placed in a more prominent location, does that draw attention more to the note disclosures that are related to that item? And do those note disclosures also kind of step up to play a role in valuation when the related items in the financial statements themselves become more prominently displayed? Okay, so kind of that interaction we're looking at, and that is our second research objective here. So there's um, a large body of research suggesting that the placement uh, of financial statement items uh, matters. Okay? Um, there have been studies that have looked at earnings components within the income statement, okay? simply within, not just across, but within one financial statement, the income statement, uh, the way in which earnings components are displayed uh, matters, okay? going all the way back to uh, Life and Fairfield et al., and they find that earnings components have lower value relevance and predictive power for future earnings when their placement is lower in the income statement, meaning you've got um, items that are further down the income statement, they're less paid attention to by investors, and their predictive power and uh, reaction from investors is lower. So those are kind of some early studies that looked at simply placement within the income statement, kind of you know, how high or low you are in the income statement. More recently, um, other studies have looked at particular classifications of items and found that the way we classify them and describe them, again, within an income statement, can have implications for evaluation as well. Okay, so this uh, Bartoff and um, uh, Mahanram have the paper on the uh, debt extinguishments, and for a long time, uh, debt extinguish gains and losses on debt extinguishments, if certain class uh, criteria were met, uh, could have been classified as an extraordinary item. And they find that the debt extinguishment um, gain or loss after the FASB prohibited classifying these gains or loss as an extraordinary item, that impacted uh, their value relevance. Okay? Their value relevance increased after the FASB no longer allowed firms to describe it as an extraordinary item. Okay, so the way in which we describe things and label them in financial statements can impact valuation. And I'm sure that probably was an impetus. As you know, the FASB has abolished extraordinary items completely now. And so that is within in, uh, one financial statement. And then there's also been some experimental research looking at how amounts are displayed across financial statements, and in particular, uh, looking at OCI. So after the FAS 130 came out in 1997 that prompted uh, a small batch of experimental research that looked at how 
uh, investors and participants in experiments reacted to OCI information, depending on whether it was displayed in one financial statement, in a separate financial statement, or in the statement of stockholders' equity. So Hearst and Hopkins um, uh, got a bunch of uh, 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 analysts to look at various uh, different displays of comprehensive income, and they found that the comprehensive display format, whether it was in one statement, two statements, or in the statement of stockholders' uh, equity, influenced the valuation uh, of a bunch of buy side analysts that were participating in an experiment. Same numbers, but just displayed differently. Later, uh, Mains and McDaniel uh, did a, uh, an experiment where the display of available for sale uh, OCI gains and losses, this was under the pre ASU 2016-01 when uh, equities uh, gains and loss, unrealized gains and losses could be classified as available for sale and therefore go to OCI. The display of those gains and losses uh, whether it was one statement, two statements, or statement of stockholders' equity, influenced the judgment, the valuation judgment of non-professional investors. So they basically just got some volunteers who weren't necessarily uh, ex uh, financial experts to participate in experiments, and their influence of the value of the company, uh, their judgment of the valuation of the company was influenced by the, the manner in which these OCI gains and losses on equity securities were displayed. So... This is leading us to believe, and a lot in some of the uh, the two papers we mentioned uh, earlier, that the placement okay, of OCI, obviously, is the prominence of OCI is going to differ based on how it is placed, whether it is in a more prominent uh, performance statement or whether it is really just kind of buried in the statement of stockholders' equity, which nobody really pays attention to, and... Um, and which is not really taught that much when we teach accounting. Um, and that differential display could influence the value relevance. Yeah. Hi, I, 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 so, yeah. Yep. I, I think this is a good time to break. It's just like uh, previously you talk about there are two <clears throat> earlier studies uh, didn't find immediate results after like one or two years, right? Um, I want to hear that in addition to the user's perspective or the preparer, how long do you think they need to implement the displacement? Right? Is, do they actually need to update their internal information system or they simply just change the same number and then put it into a different statement? It doesn't seem that the implementation actually need to take a long time. Right. So uh, in yeah. those two papers, they speculate whether there's kind of a transition period uh, yeah. of uh, one or two years, which is what they <laughs> looked at. Um, yeah. And that's consistent with what we find. Now, one or two years, you know, whether that, you know, investors really need that amount of time to actually get used to the fact that OCI, to the extent that they were looking at it at all, uh, is in a new location now, or whether that reflects that, hey, here's the OCI on a performance statement. Where did this come from? Because I have never seen OCI before because I never paid attention to the statement of stockholders equity and nor do we when we teach it to students really, okay? So we don't see it there and oh, maybe now I should go look in the notes of the financial statements to read about this more. And maybe that is the source of the transition time that was that uh, as a result of this. That's what we're trying to um, kind of tease out by doing the cross-sectional on the note disclosures. But that was kind of our thinking, yeah. And and when we do the year by year analysis later, we see that a lot of our increased value relevance is post year two. Um, okay. So that's kind of our thinking as terms of um, what may be driving this transition time. Is it investors looking at notes uh, for the first time related to OCI? I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mayor. Um, hi, Matt. When I was reading the paper, I saw ex figure one and figure two I was having I was trying to think of other reasons for why it could be like trying to rule out other alternative explanations because you sort of have a pretty clean setting like a pre-post treatment um, mm -hmm. if and diff type of setting do you happen to have the figure one and figure two components of OCI reporting by treatment and control group to see uh... if that changed yeah, that is the overall sample. And I, I could not tell you off the top of my head whether those components um, we see overall, you know, uh, uh, how they moved. But I, I don't have this off the top of my head broken down by treatment and control. That's that's a good suggestion. I um, just want to see. Um, 
if the display might actually influence um, you know, whether they're more likely to invest in these or classify the equity securities as available for sale to begin with, right? Uh, uh, yeah, difference so, treatment control. Right. So I think one of the things that I was thinking was parallel assumption because we're assuming that um, it was the only thing that happened um, was the treatment, which is just the change in the placement. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can see that the control and treatment groups have similar proportion of activities contributing to the components of OCI before and possibly uh, leading up to the transition in period, basically saying that they had the same trend, then it's a stronger argument to say that this the only change was the placement prominence. Yeah. Yep. yep. I agree. Yeah, we have some entropy balancing approaches later on controls, but I don't remember if that includes exactly how much of each component was in, but we can definitely try it using that to try to address that. In addition to, of course, looking at the overall pattern, uh, decomposed uh, treatment and control. Yep, thanks for that. Hey, Sal. Uh, hey, so I, I'm just curious, because uh, I've never seen this uh, the single uh, presentation of both the income statement and the OCI. Uh, I guess I, I guess my the other question is uh, when uh, do, do companies sometimes report the OCI with in their earnings announcement before the ten Qs or ten Ks come out? Is, does that happen? Especially for the ones that do the single statement representation. Um, in their earnings announcement, I was actually thinking of that just uh, the other day, and because the question came up, somebody um when I was presenting this paper before, uh, asked, why don't we do short window returns rather than, you know, here we just right. do long window associations. And we mentioned that, you know, we weren't exactly sure whether the OCI was in the earnings announcement itself or was included in the uh, 10Q and 10K. Um, but we, sure, we could look at a few and, and just to get a sense for whether these OCI amounts are actually reported uh, in the in the earnings announcements, as opposed to if the 10Q or the 10K is the first time that they're actually seeing the OCI number, not just the uh, no disclosure associated with it. Uh, I, I don't, don't off the top of my head know uh, how many are actually the er the time of the earnings announcement is the first time you're seeing the actual OCI number, or if it's the Q or the K, that's the first time you're seeing it. But it would be an interesting um, cut cross sectionally. Because if the first time you're seeing the OCI is the Q or the K, does that make you more inclined to actually look at the notes? Uh, whereas if it's the first time you see is that the earnings announcement, are you less likely to look at the notes? You know, by the time the Q or the K comes out, you may have forgotten about OCI by that time. So, so that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Okay, so... So we are looking at longer, you know, uh, window associations, uh, not um, earnings announcement, short window returns. Although we are um, looking into that, uh, and and again, this cross sectional cuts that we that here would be a good uh, thing to investigate as well as we revise the paper. So, okay, more broadly on OCI, um, as I said, you know. In my more cynical moments, I sometimes think OCI really, um, its purpose is to serve as a wastebasket for controversies that the FASB would rather punt on rather than take head on. But be that as it may, there is some underlying uh, theory under OCI. Uh, so clean surplus accounting is the view that all ch uh, change income uh, should be all changes in equity outside of transactions with owners. Okay. But OCI is a component of profitability under a broader umbrella of comprehensive income. And so kind of the whole Olson view of dirty surplus accounting, where you uh, kind of deviate from income that encompasses all changes in equity outside of transactions with owners, dirty surplus accounting and OCI can be justified if those OCI items have no relevance for forecasting, meaning there's no persistence and their valuation is priced dollar for dollar. And the empirical research that has kind of looked into that theory doesn't yield a whole lot of consistent conclusions. It's a little bit over the map. So Dolly Wall all, they find no evidence of a difference in return associations or predictive power between net income and comprehensive income, except financial firms. 
And then Jones and Smith find that special items exhibit zero persistence, but OCI actually exhibits negative persistence. And then this uh, paper by uh, Dong Ryan and, and Zhang looks at realized gains and losses from available for sale securities that were classified into net income. Okay, I think Alina talked about this paper last week, right? Um, they find that when those gains and losses are recycled into net income, they're actually, there's a bigger investor reaction, even though the economic substance, there's nothing different, right? They're more value relevant than unrealized gains and losses in OCI. So the simple, you know, realization and, and recycling the gain or loss into net income from OCI, that in itself, has some value relevance, even though the whole Olson theory would suggest that they shouldn't, okay? So the findings on value relevance <clears throat> regarding OCI uh, has, has yielded some mixed findings uh, in, in prior research. Now, if you look at the actual ASU standard itself, okay, and if you go to the basis for conclusion sections, and whenever I teach, I always tell my students that the basis for conclusions is always the most important part of, um, of any standard that the FASB passes, because it gives you some little window and insight into what they were thinking when they actually, uh, when they actually uh, passed this standard. Okay, and their purpose, their stated purpose of ASU 2011-05 was to um, increase the prominence of items reported, okay, in OCI. Okay. <clears throat> the FASB originally wanted to report comprehensive income in one single continuous statement, okay, and because they wanted to increase the prominence, okay. But uh, there was a lot of pushback on this from companies. And so they eventually reached a compromise position. The FASB definitely want to prohibit reporting in the statement of stockholders equity. That they were not willing to compromise on. But they eventually compromised with companies in giving companies the option of using either one continuous statement or a separate statement of comprehensive income that immediately follows the income statement. So that was the compromise position that the FASB uh, issued, okay, and they made it very clear that they wanted to increase the prominence of OCI, <clears throat> okay? So what we're going to do, in addition to looking at the value relevance of OCI itself pre and post, is to examine the importance of note disclosures when OCI moves up this uh, prominence hierarchy, if you will, when OCI is going to move away from the statement of stockholders' equity uh, for most of our firms, okay, and into a more prominent performance statement, which investors and students and everyone are paying more attention to. So if we have more prominent OCI placement in a performance statement, does that draw investor attention to the notes in the financial statements related to OCI? And does this um, give a more prominent role for note disclosures related to OCI? Hi, Alina. Hey, Matt, thanks. Um, so apologies if I miss this, but um, it's it's not just the placement, but the granularity of the disclosure itself, um, I think changed. I don't know for a lot of firms. I'm looking at Johnson & Johnson, and I see in the pre-period, um, it has just the four items, as we would expect, you know, pension plans, bam, you know, dollar amount, foreign, foreign currency exchange dollar amount. And then as soon as they go to the post and they create this, um, for them, it's a separate statements right under. Um, now, instead of four, we have um, 15 items in that statement in terms of, you know, the, the kind of what those specific changes are made up of, even before we get to the notes um, for each one of them. So is that... Um, and I don't know how typical this is. I guess maybe now that it's a separate statement, it deserves more granularity. Or maybe some firms just said, okay, we had four before, we still have four, but now they're in a different position. So do you um do you take a look at that at that as well? The 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 to the extent that there's a difference in how um it changed when it moved from from the equity to the other. Yeah, yeah. So this is kind of related to Mayor's question, and and we definitely need to look. I mean, we've got Figure Two here, which shows the overall components of the 
uh, of the OCI and the, and the uh, and the number of other components. We have a fifth component, other, which is kind of a catch-all, um, but we certainly could look into whether that changed. And we also, one thing we're doing is to look at the characteristics of the notes themselves and see how they uh, poss possibly changed pre to post. Because right now our cross-sectionals are basically cutting on the median of the various textual characteristics, but we want to see if the values of those themselves change from pre to post and whether the number of items of OCI changed, whether uh, the amounts of OCI changed, which overall in the sample doesn't seem to be the case, but we need to split that uh, treatment and control. Um, so this is kind of the, I, I'd say this is definitely part of the kind of the, the broader parallel trends um, issue that was brought up. Uh, but we also want to look at whether there was more granularity in the OCI items, um, uh, simply arising from the fact that now companies have to disclose them more prominently or display them more prominently in the in the, in the performance statement. Was that kind of what you were getting at, Elena? So, okay, yeah, so. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so that's kind of the impetus uh, behind uh, what we are doing here. Okay. So our sample period is going to be from 2006 to 2017. And we're a little bit lucky in that um, this gives us a balanced subperiods of six years before and after uh, ASU 201105 uh, became effective. Okay, so we start our period in 2006 and we end in 2017. And again, we end in 2017 because, as we learned last week, ASU 201601 became effective in 2018, and that significantly changes the components of OCI. So this 12-year period, six years before and after, there were no real major components, uh, changes to the components of OCI um, or their measurement. This really begins with the start of kind of the FAS 157, 159 uh, fair value regime that the FASB uh, started at that time, and we ended promptly uh, right before ASU 2016-01 hits, uh, because this was the first major change to OCI components uh, in quite a while. Okay, so again, uh, th this ASU here, 2016-01, it eliminated the available for sale classification for passive equity investments. You know, basically all the equity investments now were being uh, treated as if they were trading. And um, it mandates that gains and losses on debt valuation adjustments go to OCI rather than net income. Okay, so we definitely want to stop the sample period right to here because we want to have a relatively clean six years pre and post where there were no major uh, changes to what goes into OCI. Rather, what we're seeing is a change in the display um, of the prominence of OCI. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the prior studies, and particularly the two that I mentioned earlier, the Lynn et al. and uh, Shabarol and Viktorovich, uh, they proceed mostly by manually collecting the OCI reporting location. So they actually literally went in to call up the um, 10Ks and 10Qs and just manually noted whether the OCI was placed in one performance statement or two. And because they're using this hand collection, they usually limit themselves. Both of those studies limit themselves to the S&P 500. So they're limiting themselves to relatively a small set of firms and obviously uh, much larger firms. What we do here is to help us automate the collection of OCI reporting for a larger number of firms. We're going to um, use the XBRL reporting that started in 2010 that requires publicly traded firms to file 10Ks in uh, Edgar using XPRL. And then one of my co-authors uh, wrote a Python script to extract the financial statement titles. Okay, and if you look at the appendix, um, you'll find uh, how, an example of how we did it. But basically we looked at the title of the performance statement to determine whether it, the OCI was being reported in one statement or there was a separate statement of comprehensive income. We'd extract that title Okay, to determine whether following AS, the adoption of ASU 2011-05, uh, whether the firm was changing the reporting location of OCI, okay, from the statement of stockholders equity into a performance statement. 
Okay, so we first uh, want to examine OCI value relevance in general between treatment and control firms here. Okay, so our first uh, research objective, as I discussed earlier, is we want to kind of re examine the seemingly counterintuitive findings from those first two studies I mentioned and to see really if anything has changed in the four years of our post uh, period that are after the two initial two years that were examined by those two studies, okay? So first we're going to examine uh, whether relative to control firms, the treatment firms will experience a positive change in OCI value relevance from pre-ASU to post-ASU, okay? So we're basically gonna employ a basic uh, diff and difference uh, design. Uh, with the caveats and the things that we want to follow up with uh, regarding parallel trends in that. Uh, hi, Juan. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I have a question about um, whether there is any prior research evidence or have you thought about the possibility of um, some kind of like earnings management type of activities? Like it could be even like real earnings management affecting um, now that OCI has become more visible, is there any incentive for the firms to kind of do something with it? Yeah, one thing we were thinking about is the whole, the, uh, the, the Stevens Ryan's paper on the recycling when the value relevance becomes more uh, increased when the firms recycle uh, what was the OCI gains and losses on available for sale securities into net income, whether that in particular, something like that, mm -hmm. as this mandate came up, whether firms were actually that impacts like the the their likelihood of recycling <clears throat> the gains and losses in net income. Um, so we definitely want to look into that. I'm not uh, off the top of my head. I'm not aware of research that looks into that. There's not a whole lot of research into this ASU uh, beyond those two um, papers that I cited. Um, but it definitely would be an interesting extension to look at whether the actual behavior related to items. In OCI has changed as a result uh, of this change in uh, the prominence of its display. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, um, and the kind of underlying logic behind this is pretty straightforward. We think that the relation between uh, placement and value relevance uh, oops, uh, would be uh, impacted by the prominence of display based on those uh, you know, classic papers going all the way back to life at all. And then um, we also think that the relation between OCI placement and value relevance, okay, basically this first time process here, is itself going to be influenced by characteristics of note disclosure. So Francis et al. find that um, firms with higher earnings quality tend to provide more expansive voluntary disclosures in annual reports. And so we're going to use various disclosures as characteristics of note disclosures that we have the ability to tease out now using textual analysis that may not have been available at the time that you know, these kind of studies were done. And these are gonna form the basis of our second hypotheses. And we're basically gonna have one for each of the various characteristics of note disclosure that we look at. So one characteristic we look at is specificity, okay? Um, the use of specific and concrete language in disclosures, no disclosures related to OCI. So this paper by um, <clears throat> I hope et al. Uh, 2016 finds that uh, more specific disclosure, less boilerplate uh, disclosures, uh, give more arrive, give more information content into uh, earnings okay, and other reported numbers. So specificity is one characteristics of no disclosures, you know, how boilerplate are the disclosures. The numeric intensity of the note disclosures related to OCI, okay, which is the proportion of numbers and quantitative words in disclosures. So there's various research finding that more numerical information uh, in disclosures lowers the cost of equity uh, and improves the quality of the disclosures. Okay? Um, we look at the readability uh, of the disclosures, the use of clear language in disclosures. That's clear and intelligible. So uh, studies have found that less readable reports, okay, leads to higher stock price crash risk and higher uh, bond yields. And finally, the length of the disclosure. And here, 
there's been some um, varying findings and mixed evidence. So this Dolly Wallet paper, uh, 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 et al. paper and this Callan et paper finds that longer disclosures reveal more information to investors, and that might help better understand OCI value relevance. But then there's been other papers that have found that longer disclosures reflect more firm complexity and can add difficulty for OCI valuation. So we kind of have some mixed evidence here. So this kind of hypothesis will be um, non-directional. Yes, uh, Oliver. Hey, Matthew, just a, just a question regarding um... Uh, underlying channels. Um, so, do you know whether the uh, statement of shared equity was audited before, and whether that kind of now changed relative to uh, the relative to OCI? Is that uh, so? Just the underlying question, I guess. Is there potentially also a channel where you just have like a more credible number because you have a, a verified number in some sense now? I guess it's just. It, it doesn't. It's not clearly related to those tests here, but just something in terms of institutional detail to think about. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly, the statement of stockholders' equity is you know audited nominally, um, but the extent to which auditors pay attention to something certainly might change as a result of its more um, prominent display. Just like when you know when I was in uh, working and back in my auditing days, the numbers in the like say MDNA, which don't relate directly to financial statements, certainly are given less attention overall. You know, we look at some schedule prepared by the client, tick and tie it, and that would be basically it. We may or may not look at underlying source documents for those. And something analogous could happen, even though both financial statements are audited, even if something goes from the statement of stockholders' equity to a performance statement, it might get more attention from auditors. Um, as well. Uh, I definitely buy that. I'd have to think about operationally how we could execute um, some kind of test related to that, but that's definitely a possibility. Yep. Okay, so these four characteristics of uh, OCI related note disclosures we're going to be looking at and basically seeing whether uh, the diff and diff of OCI value relevance in here uh, varies cross-sectionally based on the attributes of these disclosures. Do these disclosures kind of step up now that OCI's prominence uh, has stepped up? Okay, so mechanically, how we're going to extract these characteristics of note disclosures, um, we're going to extract OCI-related financial statement notes um, using a Python script where we basically take the, we search for keywords related to OCI and then get the, um, X number of words before and after those keywords to get those note disclosures uh, from each uh, firm's 10K. And then we are going to construct uh, measures of these textual attributes of these OCI related note disclosures based on these four characteristics I mentioned. So for specificity, we use the Stanford uh, entity uh, package. Numeric intensity, we're basically just a percentage of the words that are numeric. Uh, for readability, we use the, the fog index, and for length, it's basically just a word count. So, Okay, so um, here is our sample selection. As I said, we have a pretty well-balanced sample of six years before and after. Uh, in total, we've got a little over 28,000 firm years, representing just under uh, 3,000 firms in Edgar that we were able to match to CompuStat and CRISP. Okay, and uh, this is kind of the um, profile of firms and how they were reporting before the ASU and where they moved to after the ASU. And of course, our sample firms, our, our treatment firms are going to be groups one and two, firms that were uh, in a statement of stockholders' equity and then change to a performance statement. And then our control group, which again is smaller, um, and we try to address that later, uh, firms that continue to report OCI in a performance statement. Okay, And uh, there were, as I said before, there were no firms that changed from one performance statement to two or vice versa. Uh, whatever performance statement they were in before the, the ASU, they stuck with that after the ASU. Ayo? Yeah, so I met, I saw that later you have a Heckman model and other matching techniques to actually match treatment and control. But I have a question about XBRL. So if you go one slide before, I think that's, um, I just have a question that's, um, 
is there any period that actually firms voluntarily use XBIL uh, or not use XBIL leading to kind of some firms actually you have to delete from the sample or is actually 100% compliance after 2011? It was yeah. mandatory at that period, uh, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I, I was not the Python guru on this paper, so I'd have to ask my co-author. Um, okay. But it was mandatory uh, adoption at that period. And if anybody else knows, please feel free to chime in. But my understanding was that it was mandatory at that period. And from that, we can extract uh, whether they were reporting in one statement or uh, uh, or two prior to when the ASU became effective. So, so you may want to see the number of XBRL firms uh, by year because mm -hmm. uh, for another project I have, it, I feel like they are very spotty observations before 2019 or 18. Okay. Uh, somehow yeah. it jumps up uh, recently, but maybe that's just a different line item uh, we are looking at. Yep, okay. we'll definitely check that out. Okay, so um, as we kind of alluded to just now, um, obviously firms uh, prior to this ASU were choosing whether or not to uh, report in the statement of stockholders equity or in a uh, performance statement. <laughs> so we're going to uh, take the uh, similar approach that was done by Lynn et al. Oh, sorry, that should be 20. Um, 12 rather than uh, 21. So uh, we use a two stage model to address the firm's own selection of OCI reporting location prior to this ASU. So this is basically the same uh, OCI placement model that was used by the Lin et al. paper that was looking at those initial first uh, one or two years after the ASU. And they basically modeled the selection uh, of reporting OCI in a statement of performance, okay, as opposed to the statement of stockholders equity by using the average uh, values of various um, hypothesized predictors prior uh, to the ASU coming into effect. Um, and this includes the actual components of the OCI themselves, how much they're reporting um, in pension, how much OCI they're reporting in unrealized gains and losses, foreign currency, et cetera. Uh, and it also includes the volatility of that OCI. So this kind of captures a little bit uh, of what firms were actually doing uh, in OCI prior to this ASU, but definitely we want to look at the actual values themselves and see how they differ pre and post treatment and control. Okay, so um, so this first stage model, um, we find that um, performance statement reporting is related to uh, higher market to book, uh, greater OCI complexity, in other words, the number uh, of uh, OCI items uh, that you have, uh, foreign currency translation adjustments and uh, other adjustments. And so using that first model, okay, that uh, in, in, in as far as the self-selection into uh, performance statement or statement of stockholders equity, okay, we're first going to re-examine the results of these two key early studies, which were very early studies that looked at that first year or two after the ASU came out. And again, they found that treatment firm OCI relevance vis-a-vis -vis the control firms actually declined after the ASU, which presumably was not the FASB's intent, okay? But again, they looked at a very small set of firms in a short adoption period. And then the Shabarol and Vikrovich uh, paper, they openly speculate that there might've been a transition period as investors became accustomed to this new regime. Okay, so um, our main specification is we're going to look at the value relevance of the uh, decomposition of comprehensive income into net income and OCI. Um, so our dependent variable is 12 month returns starting eight months prior to the fiscal year end, pretty much consistent with uh, most of the classic value relevance stories. And as you can see here, our main variable interest, of course, is gonna be that um, interaction of treat post and OCI. Okay, so first we find that when we consider a longer sample period than those two previous studies, so again, we've got a full six years here now instead of those one or two years uh, that they previously looked at, we find that the incremental value OCI value relevance is indeed positive in this case, okay? And so this is the um, Lynn et al. 2018 paper, 
Okay, and again, there's that negative coefficient they found using just the one or two years after the ASU and using the S&P 500 firms. And when we replicate, okay, Lin et al., okay, using S&P 500 firms in just those one or two years, we uh, get pretty close to what they actually found, which is good, okay? But then when we expand it to a full six years after the ASU and exp expand our set of firms to almost 3,000 firms rather than just the S&P 500, uh, we find that we do have an overall positive impact of this ASU when we consider that full six years after the ASU. And this table, what we do here is, this table does the regression using the six pre-ASU years plus year one or year two or year three, right? One through six. And we find that when we look at the first six years plus the first or second year after the ASU, we don't get this loading here, but when we look at year by year, three, four, five, and six, we do get it there, okay? So it appears, you know, this is broadly consistent with the kind of speculative remarks in those two other papers that there may have been this, for whatever reason, this transition period immediately after the ASU. Yeah, Ayo? Matt, do you have the itemized, so like uh, like figure one numbers to break down this OCI into uh, like foreign currency? Because a lot of them actually are fair value uh, measurement, right? And then yeah. so your dependent variable is a start return. Your right hand side variable will be start returns of other firms or asset returns from other entities. And then in asset pricing, usually there's a main reversion, right, going on. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I think somehow... I'm still very curious about why does it take two years either for the market to re respond to this displacement effect that somehow if you can explain that puzzle, like why, why does it take, yeah, it seems that the market is very, very inefficient in that yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that <laughs> so is... inefficient that it takes um, yeah, that long for them to. Now, yeah, whether this triple action is being driven by any particular OCI component. Yeah, uh, yeah. We have table four where we look at the components, but that's overall OCI value rounds. But looking at whether this ASU yeah. differentially impacted any component would be a worthwhile investigation. Hi, Oliver. Hey, Matt, just a thought here. I mean, like, would it make sense to, uh, in addition to OCI, also include the interaction terms for net income so that you can really talk about, like, the incremental benefit of like these things that are being disclosed in this additional statement mm -hmm. that you can really talk to that rather than um, you know running the danger of reflecting some of the change in value relevance around net income whatever yeah. that might have happened. Yeah, so just put in the triple action of net income as well um, in there, so yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, we I have uh, just five more minutes to- Okay, yeah. I will, okay, so we've seen the main result here. And then um, our main hypothesis, our other hypothesis is the cross-sectionals on these um, note disclosure characteristics. And so basically we're gonna be looking at, uh, we're gonna be partition the sample based on these um, note characteristics. And we see that the triple interaction, uh, we see that firms with more specific disclosures, the effect uh, concentrates in those, um, more numerically intensive disclosures, Okay, that triple interaction it, it loads stronger for those. Um, more clear disclosures, so lower fog, meaning more clear disclosures. We see the results are stronger there. And we see that um, disclosures that are shorter overall, the results are concentrating in there. Okay, so it does seem that note disclosures kind of step up, uh, so to speak, and are a little bit play a little more important role. Uh, in valuation when the prominence of the item to which those disclosures relate uh, increases in prominence as well, <clears throat> okay? And uh, we do another cross-sectional, we didn't formally hypothesize this, but we do another cross-sectional where we look at whether this cross-sectional on the note disclosures uh, is concentrated when there is a less sophisticated investor base uh, proxied by lower institutional investor ownership and lower analyst following. So basically what we're doing is we're looking at the difference in the difference of the triple interaction. So that's diff and diff and diff and diff and diff, if that's enough diffs for you. And we do find that this um, difference, uh, the differential power of the uh, note disclosure characteristics is stronger 
when you have uh, a set of investors that might not have paid real close attention uh, to the notes to begin with. You have lower institutional ownership. You see that big difference there, but not a significant difference uh, in the high institutional ownership. And a similar story with regards to analyst following. <clears throat> okay, and then we um, did some entropy balancing. Uh, match control group tried to mitigate the differences in covariance in our first stage uh, model, and we found the main cross sectionals uh, in the no disclosure characteristics continue to load there, although there's certainly a lot more we can do with regards to uh, self selection and display, uh, how the components of the OCI. Uh, amounts, uh, what their profile is between the treatment and control firms pre and post ASU. But um, this is uh, some stab at trying to get into that uh, ever vexing issue of uh, self selection there. So, to conclude, um, we find that relative to firms uh, which were not impacted by this ASU, the value relevance of OCI increased for firms that were required to change the placement of that OCI from the statement of stockholders equity into a more prominent uh, performance statement. So we hope that we have at least uh, shed some light and, and started to address some of those counterintuitive and puzzling findings from those early research that looked at the very first couple of years after that ASU. Um, it appears there was some kind of transition period, but certainly we can look more into why um, it took two years uh, for the FASB's desired uh, effects to manifest. And we find that increase in value relevance for treatment firms vis-a-vis -vis control firms uh, is stronger when those firms have no disclosures related to OCI that are more specific, uh, more numerical have more numerical information, less fog or more readable, and are more concise. So we think we contribute to two streams of research and we're really kind of at the intersection of both of them. Um, one is a longstanding literature <clears throat> that looks at financial statement placement, you know, the whole recognition versus disclosure, that kind of thing, and its influence uh, on uh, value relevance and predictive power. I mentioned the Bartov et al, Jeremy Michael's paper that looks at natural disasters randomly around year end, whether they're recognized or disclosed. And then the other recent literature uh, really is more exploiting on the linguistic and uh, textual analyses to assess how disclosure characteristics influence investor reactions and other outcomes. And um, there's a lot of papers on that that I don't need to cite now. And, but our findings suggest that if we look at either of these two sets of literature, neither of these two aspects of financial reporting in isolation, that may not tell the whole story. At least in our setting with regards to OCI, it seems that these two aspects of financial reporting interact. So when a particular financial statement item is placed in a more prominent location, as we would see in these studies, it seems that the accompanying note disclosures, which we looked at in these studies, those accompanying note disclosures on that item step up as well, and they assume a more prominent role in its valuation as well. So we hope we've con um, contributed to both of these literatures and show how these literatures uh, might be influencing each other. Okay, so that is really all I have. And I uh, thank you so much for being here and all your comments as we work to revise this paper. And um, next time, uh, next week, May 18th, uh, we have our next presentation at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And uh, my fellow Jesuit school uh, compatriots, Ruth and uh, Benjamin are gonna be presenting their paper, and we hope to see everyone there. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Do you mind stop recording and oh, yes. people may ask you offline questions? Yeah.